Pilate asked Jesus a question of great significance. He asked, what is truth? The Greek word translated as truth describes something that accords with reality rather than an illusion. In English, the word truth is defined by the Oxford Dictionary as that which is true or in accordance with fact or reality. And with that in mind, we want to turn in our Bibles to Matthew chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, we find a series of parables from Jesus. And one of these is the parable of the weeds. Let's read this parable from the text beginning in verse 24. And as we look at the parable, we find Jesus providing a number of important truths. The Bible says he put another parable before them, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men were sleeping, his enemy came and sowed weeds among the wheat and went away. So when the plants came up and bare grain, then the weeds appeared also. And the servants of the master of the house came and said unto him, Master, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have weeds? He said unto them, An enemy has done this. So the servants said unto him, Then do you want us to go and gather them? But he said, No, lest in gathering the weeds you root up the wheat along with them. Let them both grow together until the harvest, and at harvest time I will tell the reapers, Gather the weeds first and bind them in bundles to burn, but gather the wheat into my barn. That is the story that Jesus told. But we know that Jesus wasn't just telling a story. There is a spiritual message behind this that is the primary meaning. The true meaning may not be readily apparent to us. In fact, it wasn't clear in the minds of the disciples when they first heard it. We see later in this chapter, the Bible records in verse 36 that Jesus left the crowds and went into the house. And there the disciples ask him to explain the parable of the weeds in the field. They wanted to understand the true message that Jesus is giving, and Jesus agrees to give the explanation. And as we continue in the text, we have the explanation recorded for us, beginning verse 37. Jesus answered, The one who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. The field is the world, and the good seed are the sons of the kingdom. The weeds are the sons of the evil one, and the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are angels. Just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the world. The Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears, let him hear. Both in the seven verses of the parable and the seven verses of the explanation, Jesus reveals important truths. He describes what accords with reality about these things. And so we want to look at the parable and notice the account of the weeds among the wheat. And as we do so, we want to see several things that Jesus provides for us, identifying as being true, things that accord with reality that are essential for us as Christians to recognize as being true. Unfortunately, there are many in the church today that fail to understand the truthfulness of these things, and they're being deceived into believing what is simply not true. In the first place, notice from this parable the reality of evil. There is a big push in our society to blur the distinction between what is good and evil, and one way that is done is through efforts to redefine what we view as evil. 
using human standard, the world is trying to whitewash evil into being something that it isn't. And so the world claims there's nothing wrong with what the Bible clearly teaches is wicked. But we need to keep in mind that this parable is primarily about the church. Jesus begins by saying the kingdom of heaven. And from this language we know this is one of the parables about the church. Verse 38, he says the field is the world. Now don't let that throw you. Jesus hasn't suddenly changed his mind about what the parable has to do with. Sometimes the Bible does use the term world with regard to those outside of Christ, but is also used to refer to the worldwide reign of Christ. And so this then is a look at the church in a worldwide sense. In verse 41, Jesus says the angels will gather out of his kingdom, that is, the church. He's still speaking of the church. And this is one of the verses that teaches us that there is evil within the church. Notice the contrast that Jesus draws between the good and evil. In verse 24, Jesus speaks of good seed, and then later he explains that this seed represent the sons of the kingdom. The good seed in this parable is not the word of God, but rather what that word produces as it spread in honest hearts. By contrast, in verse 25, he also speaks of weeds, and Jesus identifies those as the sons of the evil one. The master sowed good seed, as the servants note in verse 27, but then later another seed is sown, which produced the weeds. The word weeds in the Greek is only used in this chapter of Matthew, nowhere else. It's translated as in the ES, uh, ASV and King James as tares, it is defined as a kind of darnel resembling wheat. And Thayer notes that this weed looks like wheat except that the grains are black. According to verse 26, it was only when the plants came up and bore grain that the problem was recognized. <coughs> the pulpit commentary notes that the weeds are a kind of ryegrass and the only species of the grass family, the seeds of which are poisonous. In fact, the word itself comes from the word for vomiting, one of the terrible aspects of this. And so this is more than just a nuisance in your yard. This is a very significant problem. The presence of evil in the Lord's church is a truth that we need to recognize. And that's what Jesus is teaching here. It's interesting to me that when the disciples hear the parable, before they ask Jesus for the explanation, they put a title to it, or at least a description. They call it the parable of the weeds. And so they understood this to be a significance of the parable, and they were correct in that. At first, we might not be able to tell the difference between genuine Christians and people who are just acting. There may be some, even some perhaps in this assembly, who might be hypocrites, who might be deceivers. They might actually be evil. And we might not know that because we cannot read people's hearts. But we need to understand that the belief that all within the church are genuine and holy people is an illusion. It doesn't fit with reality. Now notice the servants did not know where the weeds came from, but once the grain was produced, they were able to see a difference. And in the same way in time, we might be able to tell a difference. We're able to know a tree by its fruit, Luke 6, 44. And so we might essentially, uh, eventually see the evidence of e evil people in the church. There are wicked people who are going to be engaged in a whole host of evil things, even those who claim to be among God's people. And so we may be surrounded by evil both outside the church but also inside, 
and it will do us harm if we pretend that's not the case. But in the second place, notice from this parable also the reality of the enemy. The fact that there are weeds among the wheat was not the result of some accident. It was not the result of birds dropping seed into the field. It was a deliberate and malicious act. And it was done by an enemy. Verse 25 contains a reference to the enemy. In verse 28, Jesus again references the enemy. Well, who is this enemy? In verse 38, Jesus identifies the enemy as the evil one. Verse 39 is unmistakable. Jesus says the enemy is the devil. Jesus is teaching us about something that is not a myth. This is something that accords with reality. The Bible teaches the devil is a real being. And that might be simple for us to understand, but let me share with you in 2009... The Barna Group surveyed over 1,800 self-described Christians and found that 40% strongly agreed that Satan is not a living being but a symbol of evil. An additional 19% said they agree somewhat with that statement. And only a minority of those surveyed, only 26%, said they strongly disagreed. And so these and other polls reveal that many people believe the term Satan is simply figuratively to personify the concept of wickedness. And I'm sure that Satan is delighted by those polls. But the view that the devil is not a living being is an illusion. Jesus is teaching, we need to understand that the devil's existence is a reality. Not only that, but he's our spiritual enemy. In fact, the very Hebrew word Satan means one who is an adversary. And his goal is to work against all that is good. Satan's mission is all about destruction. We're familiar with 1 Peter 5, 8 that says, He's like a roaring lion prowling about, seeking someone to devour. And that English word devour comes from a term that literally means to swallow down or to gulp entire. That's what Satan wants to do with Christians. He has a plan for your life. You might not have a clear, direct plan for your life, but be assured that Satan has a plan for your life. He wants to destroy you completely. And so in Ephesians 6, 1, Paul urges us to put on the whole armor of God. Why? So that we may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. The Greek word schemes there is a root of our English word method. Yes, Satan has a method to his madness. He uses cunning arts, deceit, craft, or trickery as the word is defined. And so as followers of God, we need to be prepared to defend ourselves, to fight against our enemy. He is actively working toward his wicked ends, and we can easily become his prey if we're not on guard. There is good news, however. We can be successful in our fight against him. The Bible makes that clear. Ephesians 4, verse 27 says, we don't have to give a foothold to Satan. 1 Corinthians 10, 13 says, we don't have to give in to the temptations that he brings. 2 Corinthians 2, 11 says, we don't have to be outwitted by Satan, and we can know about his evil schemes. James 4, 7 says, we can resist him, and he will flee from us. 1 John 2 verse 13 speaks about the possibility of overcoming the evil one. 1 Peter 5 9 says we can resist him and stand firm in our faith. Just as the sowing of the weeds didn't occur accidentally, our victory over the enemy won't occur by accident either. 
We must be watchful. We must be prepared to wage the battle that we're in, spiritually speaking. And Jesus is telling us this enemy is real. This is not an illusion. In the third place, notice from the parable the reality of endurance. There's very clear references in this parable for our need for endurance and exercising patience as the good and evil are together in the church. The text makes it clear that the weeds were sown among the wheat. They were right there together in the church. There was such a closeness that gathering out the weeds would destroy the wheat as well. It would be torn up in the efforts to remove them. The master is concerned about those who are righteous. And if allowing good to remain with evil for a period of time will be for their benefit, God will allow that. Remember in Genesis 19, God would have spared Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities of the plain if there were only ten people that were righteous. God is concerned about that. But he will allow them to be together for the sake of the righteous. Now in this parable, the servants were eager to correct this situation immediately and completely. By their question, they reveal that they already have a plan and just need the master's approval. Master, we're ready to go and take out the weeds, but they didn't receive that permission. Jesus teaches that those who are good need to bear up under the difficulty. It was the master who had the right to determine when the separation would occur, and they needed to wait until it was that time. The directive was given to allow them both to grow together for a time. There was a need for endurance. The word endurance is defined as the ability to endure an unpleasant or difficult process or situation without giving way. It's to withstand hardship or adversity, especially the ability to sustain a prolonged stressful effort or activity. We're not going to be able to completely eliminate evil in the world. Our enemy will see to that. Neither will we be able to get rid of all the sin in the church, but we need to have the ability to endure it even though it is difficult. We need to, however, make it very clear that that does not mean the church has no responsibility to practice loving church discipline. Some people appeal to this parable to claim God just wants to leave everyone together He'll deal with the sinners within a congregation, and there's no action that you should take. That's an abuse of this parable. We cannot take any figurative language and pit it against clear Bible teaching. We have the responsibility to exercise church discipline toward those who are in rebellion against God. In fact, later in this same book, in Matthew 18, Jesus addresses the need for discipline and specifies the correct process, including, if necessary, withdrawal of fellowship from those who are impenitent. He can't be contradicting what he said in chapter 13. Why would he say this is the correct way to handle it, but don't worry about that, you never need to use that? That doesn't make any sense. Paul commanded the brethren in 2 Thessalonians 3, verse 6, by the authority of the Lord Jesus Christ to withdraw from every brother that is walking disorderly. His command was given by the Lord's authority, and so we must obey that. Keep in mind also that in 1 Corinthians chapter 5, the apostle Paul rebuked that congregation for not exercising church discipline, And he commands them in verse 13 to purge the evil man from among you. What we need to do is understand that this is talking about divine intervention in the future for the worldwide church and not our actions today within the local congregation. There's a vast difference. 
And yet, as much as we might want to, we cannot right every wrong. For example, we may suspect but be unable to accurately identify everyone who is simply playing church and is not genuine or prove that some professed Christians are lying about the way they're living. And in those instances where we lack information, we're unqualified to act, and so we cannot. There are things that we must deal with over a period of time, and dealing with that evil that is present among us may be one of them. In regard to God's ultimate justice, to borrow the language of Habakkuk chapter 2 verse 3, if it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. And yet in the meantime, we must have endurance. In the fourth place, let's notice also from this parable the reality of the end. The master directed his servants to let them both grow together until, the text says, there's a time element, not forever, Verse 30, let them both grow together until the harvest. And at harvest time, then the reapers will come. There's a coming time Jesus calls the harvest. What is that? Verse 39 says the harvest is the end of the age. Verse 40, just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire, so will it be at the end of the age. The harvest is the end of the world or the end of the age. This physical world will not last forever. It's not going to be destroyed by heat death when the sun loses its energy. It will come to an end when God specifies it will come to an end when Jesus returns. In 2 Peter chapter 3, Peter writes of this. The text says, The heavens and the earth that now exist are stored up for fire, being kept until the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. In verse 10, the text says, the day of the Lord will come. That's a statement of fact. This day will come. This is reality. The atheist is going to scoff at that. And they're concerned about this globe and say it will just continue on as it has been. That's an illusion. We're reminded in verse 7 that this end will mark the day of judgment. And so the Bible speaks about this as a time of reckoning. The Bible is teaching us what will be. 2 Corinthians 5.10 teaches that we must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or bad. Let me ask you this question. Would you rather believe the words of fallible, finite men who don't know the future, or the word of an infallible, infinite God who does know the future? While we may be bothered by evil people among the righteous, while we may not be able to identify them or deal with them, we recognize that God will hold such people accountable in the end. They will have to give answer to their lives before an all-knowing God, and we can leave that in God's hands. In the fifth place, notice also from this parable the reality of exclusion. In this parable, Jesus does identify an exclusion, and it's one that we need to take seriously. The word exclude means to prevent or restrict the entrance of, and it can denote the act of denying someone access to a privilege or a place. Verse 41 says, The Son of Man will send forth his angels. They will gather out of his kingdom all causes of sin and all lawbreakers, and throw them into the fiery furnace. There can be no mistake that some will be taken out of the kingdom. At the end of time, there will be a tragic separation in which some people will be removed from the church and cast into eternal punishment. 
there are going to be some Christians who are excluded from heaven, being prevented from entering that glorious realm. And that is a very sad fact, but it is a fact nonetheless. The Bible is telling us about the reality of this exclusion. The concept of once saved, always saved is in opposition to what Jesus teaches here and elsewhere. The Bible nowhere supports that view. The scriptures clearly teach some of those who have obeyed the gospel, have enjoyed salvation, will not be granted salvation in heaven. The fault is not with God. It's not with the truth. The fault is with people. Jesus sent his son to be the sacrifice to save mankind from sin. But that doesn't mean everyone will ultimately be saved. That's because God allows people freedom of choice. Even those who are once washed from their sins can return to a life of sin. Listen to the words of 2 Peter chapter 2, beginning in verse 20. For if, after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ... They are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after having known it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. What the true proverb says is happening to them. The dog returns to its own vomit and the sow after washing itself returns to wallowing in the mire. Christians who turn their backs on God will be allowed to do just that. But they will have to answer for that and suffer eternal punishment if they do not repent. Verse 42 says they will be thrown into the fiery furnace. And it says in that place there shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And so this judgment does not thrill our souls in any way and neither does it God. God paid a high price to offer forgiveness to mankind, but he will allow people to make their choice, but he will hold them accountable. Vincent notes that the language is, uh, well, let's look at, the, I'm sorry, let's look at the end of the righteous. Jesus also speaks about the future of those who are genuine and faithful Christians, those who are not gathered out of the kingdom, but are remaining there. He declares in verse 43, then... That is, again, at the end of the world, the righteous will shine like the sun in the kingdom of their Father. The righteous shall shine forth as the sun behind a cloud, a bursting of light. This is the glorious conclusion to the life of those who are dedicated to God. They will enjoy the inheritance of an eternal heaven, an eternal reward. That description should not only thrill us, but also remind us of the great need to we, we have to be those who are considered righteous, not in our own eyes, but in the eyes of God. The explanation of the parable ends with an important exhortation that we should not overlook. Jesus says in verse 43, he who has ears, let him hear. That's what's said in verse 9 as well. A variation of this is found seven times in Revelations chapter uh, 2 and 3. Now we have ears, but Jesus emphasizes our need to use them. He is calling us for us to pay particular attention to what he's saying. We need to carefully listen and to consider what Jesus is teaching in this parable. He's teaching us what is reality. Not all of it is pleasant. And some of it is difficult for us to accept. But Jesus said, here's the truth. This is what accords with reality. In each of these statements, his word stands as divine revelation. And so we need to accept them as that. And have our ears open to accept the truth that he's teaching. But our acceptance of the truthfulness of the words doesn't signal the end of our duty. We must apply the teaching so it can change how we live. His teaching demands that we recognize evil and understand that Satan is our enemy. 
It demands that we live with faithfulness and endurance because we know there is an end coming. The time when those who reject the truth will be excluded from eternal bliss. But those who are righteous will be among those who shine like the sun in the kingdom of the Father. There are weeds and there is wheat. This evening, ask yourself the question, which are you? You're either a son of the kingdom or you're a son of the evil one. But there's good news because unlike the plant world, we understand plants can't change, but we can change. Whatever our spiritual condition, we have the ability to make a change. And so even if we are weeds, we can become wheat. If we are sons of the evil one, we can obey the gospel and become sons of the kingdom. We might be tares among the wheat, but we can become wheat. We can become those who are righteous that God will save in the end. What is your spiritual condition? As you put yourself into this parable, where do you fit? Are you among the weeds? Or are you among the wheat that God will gather into his barn? This evening, if there's a change that you need to make in your life, we encourage you to think seriously about that and then act upon that thought as together we stand and sing. If you have a need, we invite you to come.